G'day everyone. So uh, this is another delayed answer session. I'll try and move through it pretty quickly because it seems to be a lot. I haven't had a look at all of them. Anyway, um, Tapio is back in town, which is great. Uh, good to hear a little bit about what he was up to. And uh, uh, sorry about the weekend. We were going to answer him on the weekend, but the internet at home is crazy. We're just about to get fibre in there and then it'll be a lot easier. Um, and then Monday was always crazy. Oh, okay. Not fibre, but it's something upgraded or something or other, so uh, it's coming, we hope. <laughs> okay, so maybe we won't be doing stuff at home anymore. Um, there's some issues there anyway. We're trying to sort it out. But anyway, um, we've got a whole bunch of questions here and we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, okay, why, does guy, why doesn't Guy motor? Uh, he will drop to Chichester class in any case once he hauls out? It's a good question because he's sitting there at the moment going very slow and the estimate is that he might arrive sometime late tonight about uh, 9.30 or 10 o'clock local time or something. Um, so no idea and you're quite right he could fill up with fuel but um, he's taking his time and uh, get there eventually and hit those barnacles. Um, okay next one that was from Douglas. So Deb uh, can you give us a bit of Elliot's backstory? So happy to hear that he decided to keep sailing past Cape Town. I mean, his backstory from our perspective was amazing. He was one of the last entrants and uh, he calls us up and, uh, you know, free and easy, saying he wants to do this, got no money at all, no money even for the entry fee. And uh, then he thought he could sell his boat, and uh, but he didn't get to sell it quick enough, so some friends lent him some money uh, to get the entry fee in and we told him it's a non-refundable entry fee, you know, you better be careful. Um, but it was a bit of fun and he, he paid the entry and uh, then after about six, seven, eight months we thought, oh, there's no way he's going to make it. But he got a boat, there's a whole story on the boat and I could stay here for an hour and talk about the bits but um, but I, I can't. So uh, get on his site and you'll see lots of stuff there and uh, put some interaction there with it and, and Josh and their other team will come back and probably answer you. But, but the short story was all of a sudden he just kept going, he kept going and I couldn't believe it. So often we'd say he's never going to make it and then someone else would come in and give him a hand with this and give him a hand with that and they managed to get the boat refitted and then he had a second hand uh, Aries wind vane that wasn't quite service, it was in pieces and it wasn't working. Then all of a sudden, surprising to us, when he started to sail out, pops up with a brand new hydrovane and pops up with a few other brand new bits and uh, more and more people were helping him and he's still there. And uh, interestingly, um, you know, coming down through the Atlantic, I really believe that he didn't really know, uh, you know, what was happening, what was going. He'd been swept along with the whole thing, great sailor, nice boat, all that sort of stuff, but he was questioning a lot. And it's a fascinating journey, and it's more than just an ocean voyage around the world. It's, it's, it's like Elliot's journey, you know, in a grand adventure that, that is going to change him forever. But he's already a, an interesting guy, so uh, uh, watch this space. Uh, okay. Uh, Coconut uh, Seaways wants to know, uh, give us, uh, given the weather inconsistencies and the general safer storm tracks this summer, it's fair to extend the Cape Horn dates by one month as a revision to keep the tail enders racing. No, it's not. Basically, the rules are there and they're there for safety reasons. And yes, the weather could uh, it appears to be reasonably... Um, uh, it's looking after the fleet, you might say, but it could change any minute. So uh, we can't play with those um, those rules. If you're not through by the end of March, you could get into real trouble. So uh, uh, it's January 31st, the gate shuts. Um, yes, it would be wonderful if I could, but I can't, so I won't do it. And wow, Minnehaha Daily Text K. Yeah, that's a funny T-shirt from uh, John. Good idea. Um, Eric Spielen, if an entrant is forced by strong winds to enter the no-go zone, keeping a safe course... Will he still be fined during penalties? No, there's no fines, but they get a time penalty. Um, and it's three hours for every hour they're in the zone. And the short answer to that one is yes, they would. Uh, You've you got to treat it and imagine it's like a beach or a, or a cliff or a country or call it what you like. It's a navigational hazard for the course and, and the challenge of the GGR. So you've got to stay away. And if you get pushed, you get caught on a lee shore and you get pushed down, it's bad planning. So you shouldn't be there. So yes, they would take the time penalty. Uh, the skippers don't have the luxury of long-term windy forecasts. That's exactly right, and they know that. So they have to be very careful. You know, that's that's part of the deal. Um, and it's not erroneous. It's not. It's it, it's part of the part of the game, part of the challenge. You know, it's an obstacle of the course. Stay away from it. 
Um, anyway, uh, why was uh, Matt? Why was Joshua class removed from the, the 22 GGR? It basically didn't work. That's the short story. We had some people after it. We had some challenges building the boat. In the end, the boat was stolen. Long story, um, and uh, it, it just wasn't fitting. And I'm, you know, it's interesting to try these things. You know, we never say no to anything in some ways, and it, there was some very distinct reasons why we'd do it. But in hindsight. It didn't work, and I'm quite happy, and it'll never come back again. So it's always going to be um, uh, Suheili class boats. Uh, Vivian, whereabouts of uh, uh, Gansia Americano? We still don't know yet, but we're working on it, so don't worry. Uh, no need to ask us next week. I'm hoping to get some bits there. Uh, I've got to, uh, yeah, there, there's a few things happening, so uh, stand by. Um, but we, the short story is we think it's lost, okay? that's. But we're um, trying some... Uh, some other things. It was a plywood boat, but it took six weeks to build it. You build the structure, and then he put the rigs off his catamaran that he raced in the in the Ostar uh, to put the sails on it and got going. It's an amazing story, um, but we think the hull and everything is lost now. But we'll we're still working on it. Uh, Hugo, what are the advantages and disadvantages of sloop rig catch rig? We did that last week. I won't go into it now because it was um, uh, quite a long answer there, and uh, there are some advantages. Uh, Simona, do all the weather models have the same source of information? Uh, I'll answer this in bits. Uh, yes, the only source of information is um, uh, either satellite, some satellite data now, uh, fl drifting and floating buoys in the, in the oceans that go around and they transmit information back automatically. And those information points at sea are the same as all the little country towns that uh, three or four times a day give the barometric pressure, the temperature, wind direction, strength, you know, rainfall, all that sort of stuff, into a world pool of information. And that's all digitized and it's accessible to all of the, the, the various models that come up with their computer programs based on, you know, past records and, and uh, issues like that. So yes, the raw data is all the same. Um, what I mean is get their weather information from the same boy. Uh, how can they be so different? Uh, quite easy because they use different uh, formulas to come up with, uh, you know, and track records to come up with, with um, what they believe is going to happen. And so you can imagine if you've got the whole ocean and you've got this big area as big as this room and you've got a boy there and a boy there, a lot of things can happen in between. And so uh, that's the idea of the different models. They just have a different way of interpreting it. Um, so the algorithms are different, yes. I'm wondering, look at the tracker today and the big difference in the weather forecast the 15th. Yeah, it happens. And you can see that on Windy. If you get onto the main Windy site, there's four different types of models there. Uh, well, really three of the main ones, but you can see how different it is. You know, same ocean, same thing. Hit the different models and they can be completely different. So uh, uh, it's an art as well as a science uh, and a bit of guesswork maybe. Uh, Gonzalo, if any skipper assists in a rescue at sea to a third party, would they be given ex extra time? Yes, they are. And Kirsten was given, I think, 35 hours uh, recourse on assisting Tapio. And I think uh, Avalish was sort of 13 hours or so, 15 hours, something like that. Um, uh, hi, Don. Last week you mentioned your new boat. <laughs> Please do tell. Yes, there's a new boat. You're about to hear about it in a couple of hours. It's a, a beautiful Swan 57. And uh, it's on a mission. So if you want to sail around the world, this could be your chance. So uh, stand by. The press release and news is going out tonight. Um, Tristan, uh, hi Don, last week, you, oh, sorry, uh, Eric, is Abolish managing to get fresh water out of his tank now that his pump is broken? Yeah, I'm quite certain he can get the water out of his tank, uh, so that's not a problem. Um, Sam, why are the tolerances for crossing exclusion, wh what are the tolerances for crossing exclusion zone, if any? Sexton is accurate to 200 nau 20 nautical miles, whereas a GPS transmitter is like 5 metres. Well, a sextant is accurate to uh, a mile if you've got a good site and you've got a good calculation. So that's quite good, but that's irrelevant. Um, you know, the issue is that if you know you don't want to be somewhere, that's what you've got to stay away from. So you allow a longer buffer zone for uh, the issue of wind and weather later on. You know, you, 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 you can't just say, oh, I'm not sure where it is, so I'll keep going this way. So, oh, I'm probably over now. Well, if you think you're probably over, you maybe are over and that's not a good thing. So, so you just got to stay away from it. You know, it's just a challenge to take on and, and uh, set your own limits and, uh, you know, you play the game and, and uh, you know, that's how it works. Um, Fred, on the Yellowbrick Tracker site, there are two yellow lines in Storm Bay and the Dermot Wither River. Is the first longer southern one uh, to force the boats to avoid? No, that's just a graphic just to make sure that because on the main map you'll see we have a little little breakaway box there and we show uh, the Derwent and then we show the um, Kingston Beach area. Uh, so see if it's really quite small, 
you can't even see the Kingston Beach one. So that just gives you an idea that's where it is. The, the one crossing over the Derwent is really nothing. The line that the entrants have to go over for the 90 minutes is actually between the two headlands at Kingston Beach. Uh, and we'll put that up on Facebook tomorrow because the first boat's coming. Uh, and you'll see, uh, in fact, I think we already did that. We put that up a couple of weeks ago when I was looking for volunteers. Um, so it's right in the beach. They've got to cross there and then uh, either drift or anchor or uh, there is a mooring there, but we don't, uh, that's an optional thing, you know, to pick up the mooring. So drift or anchor uh, or motor or do whatever. But Abelish just reported he's lost his motor. So uh, that's going to impact his uh, approach and how he handles it. Um, uh, certainly Tapio uh, came in there uh, in the last edition sailed in without a motor and uh, you can do it, it's not a problem, but it just takes a little bit longer. And it's one area where having a motor can save you a bit of time. Um, and the entrants know that. Uh, John again, uh, one more question for me. This week's safety call with Kirsten, I couldn't make out if she explained why she got so close to 44 degrees south. Was it due to clouds or no celestial nation fall asleep? Uh, it's a bit of a combination. I think the wind went a bit and she knew she was getting close but wasn't quite sure where it was. Uh, and so she dipped down and surprised everyone and we were hanging on by tender hooks because I didn't expect to see her down there. Um, uh, oh, I just got hot off the press from Jang Jang. Uh, Avalish has fixed his engine, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jang Jang. Um, the, uh, yeah, it was just uh, one of those things and she certainly, what we did when she was literally uh, t uh, less than half a mile from it, we sent her a message because we tell them if, if we see it, you've got to remember, so we're not watching the tracker all the time, but we saw it and she was only like half a mile, no, very close to the line, heading straight down there. And she, it was like, oh, oh, Kirsten, you're on top of the line. So we told her, and any time we see any entrant inside the zone, as soon as we see it, we'd tell them just to give them a chance to get out at least. And so we told her, and she may have theoretically, if you can imagine this, here's the line. The last position she had was sort of like there before she crossed in the line. Now, four hours later, she could have gone boom over the line for an hour and then turned around and come out for three hours and ended up here outside the line and then the two lines join up like that. So she probably very well did go into the zone and out again. But we only use the tracker track to determine whether they're in the zone and for how long. So, so uh, she probably did go in the zone, but we can't measure it, so we don't consider it and that's it. Um, okay, so yes, yeah, she wasn't about to enter. I reckon she did actually go in, but as I said, that's how we measure it. What are the criteria for them? What are the criteria in the demarcation of the no-go zone in the South Pacific? So yes, there's another no-go zone there. In fact, there's a few ob a few uh, marks in the course as well. Uh, you um, once you get around the bottom of New Zealand, you've got to uh, go above. Um, Jeepers, I should know the islands now because I've visited them 53 times. Uh, you've got the Bounty Islands and the uh, and, uh, Snares, you've got Auckland Island, you've got to be north of that, and then Antipodes, and you've got to be, uh, you've got to leave the Bounty Islands to starboard, and that's particularly to get them up out of the, out of the uh, Southern Ocean there. And then they've got another uh, area, and I forget how far south it is, it's about 45 I think this time, a little bit south, a little bit further south, and uh, stay out of that all the way along towards Cape Horn, and then when you when, you, when you're coming along uh, above the zone, if the zone's there, uh, you've actually got to, you can't go too far to the coast because there's another mark out there that you've got to leave to port and head down around underneath Cape Horn because you can get trapped up there. Uh, you get too high and what happens is if you don't head down to Cape Horn quick enough, you, when the big storms are coming, you've got to take them on your beam and that's where you get rolled over and, uh, you know, uh, dismasted, all that sort of stuff, touch wood. It's a very famous problem. Uh, with Tatung and uh, 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 Jeepers and Tongue Tied, the, the skipper of Trekker, my little boat, the first one that went. John Guswell was crew on the boat, very famous situation. That's what happened to them. They got rolled 360, pit pole, blah, blah, blah. And it happens to a lot of boats, and it happened to one of our GGR boats just before as he was delivering the boat from Melbourne to uh, uh, Melbourne to uh, La Sable de Lome, uh, getting ready for the start of 2018. Went a bit too far to the bit too far to the uh, uh, east maybe and didn't turn quick enough maybe there's lots of different factors and, and got rolled over and lost the mast so that's why those waypoints are there and that's partly because we don't want to go too far south uh, because most of the shipping 
stays at about that latitude, okay? And if we go further south and someone gets into trouble, uh, it's very challenging and difficult to ask a ship to divert. Uh, most of the severe weather is down low, but at the last minute, you've got to come down to 55 to get around Cape Horn as well. So there's a number of factors that evolve uh, to that. And I think, I have to check this, uh, the Vendée Globe has a similar range. And in fact, one time I looked at it and I thought it was actually a little bit further north than us. So we actually, I think, don't quote me, go a little bit further south even we allow it than the Vendée Globe. So, um, yeah. Uh, Eric, uh, the YB race app is using Windy's GFS uh, weather model. Why don't, uh, why don't they use uh, the ECMWS since it seems to be the more accurate? It, it's got something to do with the licensing and stuff. I don't know what Yellow Brick pay for the, the, the service of Windy or uh, maybe that's one of the versions they have. And I think it's actually a combination. It's not just the ECMWF. Uh, I think it's a combination of all of them. So it's not quite any of them, <laughs> right? Uh, it's a bit hard to describe because when I compare them sometimes, you can never see exactly the same. And I think they probably do that. They, as a generalized service, they probably make another one, which is a combination of two or three of them and put that out as the usual one. So it's completely different than the other ones on Windy. Uh, Windy's very good, you know, that's uh, fantastic. So uh, anyway, next one, not to question you, Don, as, as such, but please ask our wonderful sailors when you see them in Oz, how is it going with the food? What's your favorite and what do you miss most? <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll try and remember that. I thought they'll be thinking of food for That's absolutely true. Um, John, how much gas do the skippers start with for cooking, etc.? I assume they're using gas rather than spirit stoves. Um, yeah, most of them are using gas. Uh, they can use uh, an alcohol stove if they want. Um, that's my preference, and a lot of them are using alcohol. The Arigo stove, the old one, which is uh, you know really cool. I've used that on all of my boats. Um, and uh, it's very efficient, very easy, very safe, uh, and so on. Some are using big bottles of gas with a, with a line, and others are using the little canisters. Uh, quite a few have got jet boils on board, as well as a normal stove. Um, so it's a, it's a mix, and I, I couldn't tell you how much, uh, because every, every type of burner is different and so on, and they've, they've all got different calculations. But, but yes, gas was popular. It's all gas and alcohol um, stoves, so. Um, okay. Uh, um, Robert, GGR anti-fouling. Copper code anti-fouling was not available in 1968. True, if it's allowed, then presumably it's been permitted. Um, yeah, we don't get into the paints nowadays are a lot better than they were in 1968, so it's not an issue for us. Um, and copper coat, uh, how many of the current engines have copper coat? Captain Coconut had copper coat. Uh, I think uh, Guy has got copper coat. Um, Guy waits. Uh, no, he had the thing. Oh, there's another one. Who, who was the other ones? I forget now. There's a couple of them. Jeremy. Cop Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy's got copper coat. But generally, it doesn't work. Um, for, you know, you can see Jeremy's covered in barnacles and uh, uh, Captain Coconut uh, didn't get down far enough and so on. But in the last race, copper coat was a problem, uh, you know, partially because maybe it was applied wrongly and all the rest of it. And the big thing for copper coat, I suppose, is that it's, it, the boats aren't going really fast and uh, you've got to keep something slick and, and they themselves say you've got to go over and clean it off every now and then, things like that. So copper coat works, but it may not be appropriate for GGR. I don't know, I don't get involved with that. Um, how many of the GGR yachts with copper coat anti have significant barnacle infestations? infestations? I haven't gone into that, but certainly Jeremy's one that has uh, got a lot. And uh, weed on the hulls, or not weed, it's all barnacles. If any GGR yachts with copper coat anti-fouling have significant barnacle infestations, other can tell me why is it not effective? I don't know, I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, but certainly it does work well in the uh, Clipper race, you know, Robin o Sir Robin Ox Johnson's uh, race. He's used copper coat uh, for a long, long, long time. Very happy with it. Big, fast boat, powerful boat, saves a lot of money, good for the environment. You know, they've got people to scrub the boats every now and then, so that's cool. Um, and uh, Guy Waits would have been aware of the anti-fouling on the clipper yachts, so why has he had such barnacle problems? Well, he didn't use copper coat, he used another one, and uh, it was the same as Jean-Luc, but he only used the hard racing one. He didn't put an ablative one on the top, a couple of ablative ones, it's the soft ones that just wash off in the water as the boat's moving. Jean-Luc had two coats of that on the outside and three coats of the hard one on the inside, so the, the soft one had washed off going down through the Atlantic, 
and then in the Southern Ocean, it's the hard one. Uh, it's cold down there. There shouldn't be many uh, barnacles in the Southern Ocean. And then going north, it's so close to home, it didn't matter. And that worked for him. He didn't really dive on the boat at all, uh, and so on. So um, that's that one. Uh, and I don't have anything against copper coat, by the way, because there's plenty of other anti fouling's not working either. <laughs> you know, so it's not a problem. Copper coat's an interesting concept, and, uh, you know, I've got nothing, no, no real comment on it. Uh, follow up my question last week about information from unaffiliated ships. Besides giving the sailor his current location, let long, could he ask the ship to go on to the GGR tracker and ask for the positions of the other GGR sailors? Yes, he could. Uh, anything at all coming from another ship is uh, free information. That's the tradition of the sea. Could he then call up those sailors on the radio and give them their positions that he just got from the ship? Yes, he could, because it was free information to him and anything that they talk to each other with on the, um, uh, on the uh, radio is just free information as well. So they can absolutely do that. I know this is probably very unlikely, but just wondering if it would be allowed. Yes, it would. Uh, thanks to the patience. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, that seems to be pretty quick. Um, that's good. I think I've gone through them all. Uh, unless I skipped a bit, I'll just check here. So, uh, no, nope, that's okay. Uh, I thought there was a lot, but it might have been everyone answering uh, their own question and commenting on um, on the issue of extending the gate at uh, Cape Horn because the ramification, and we, which we won't do, we can't do it. Uh, and uh, it would be good for the entrance, but we just can't do it. And uh, you know, I think even the entrance themselves. I mean. If they think they're going to be too late, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't want to go around Cape Horn uh, after the end of March. And Guy, being a Chichester sailor, if he doesn't get through the gate, uh, he's out of the event. Any normal GGR entrant, when they get to the gate, the, the gate shuts and they can't continue until December next year. And then they return as a Voyager sailor. So it's a little bit different. Uh, but at least they get to complete their solo circle navigation. Anyway, that's uh, about it. We're uh, heading for Hob Hobart on Thursday, uh, and we won't be there until uh, Saturday uh, late afternoon. And uh, there'll be no question and answer this week, but there might be next week. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you then. Is that Christmas? I don't think it might be past Christmas then. So if it is, have a good one if you celebrate that. And uh, we'll see you soon. Hopefully still recording. Thanks very much. All good. Jane's going to shut down. See ya.